Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you who are our audiences for this episode of Right Circle, which was presented by Sri Simmons and is done in association with the Prabhakethan Foundation, Spagia, and SAS Women. Uh, before I introduce our author for the evening, I'm just going to give a couple of house requests from our side. Please send your postal addresses on 9829127335 within 48 hours, and we will send a physical copy of the book to your address. Um, now that that's out of the way, I am just going to say how delightful this evening is for me because the person who's written this book is rather special and the book that he has just published is something that we we may call the need of the hour to use the most cliche term but allow me to present to you everyone Siddharth Danman Shangvi whose first novel The Last Song of Dusk won the Betty Trask Award and a couple of other awards his second book, The Last Flamingos of Bombay, was shortlisted for the Man Asian Prize. Then he came up with this delightful fable called The Rabbit and the Squirrel, which was again highly, highly acclaimed, I would say. Um, has also been a contributor to The Time, The New York Times, and other publications. And he lives a solitary life in a beautiful village in Goa. He is a quintessential artist, if I may call him, not just a writer. And his latest book is a book of essays called Loss, which has just got released on 24th of November, 2020. And in conversation with him is Mohit Patra from Jaipur, a third generation bookseller who was behind the initiative, um, which, which kind of just spelled the way to move, move forward out for us. Uh, book is the smartest handheld device. He obviously is one of those people who, even after having got his gold medal from XLRI Jamshedpur, he made a conscious decision to step away from a corporate job and continued the legacy of his forefathers, his love for books, which he finds very humbling. And yet I think it's the most delightful way to survive, especially these days, because a book is letting you travel into its own universe in spite of the fact that none of us can go anywhere right now. But having said that, I'm going to, introduce, I'm going to just hand over the uh, evening to Siddharth and Mohit and begin on this extremely, extremely sensitive and yet beautiful session of Right Circle. Thank you, Meeta. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. So being a bookseller, you know, I also have a role of a traffic policeman. <laughs> I connect good people to good books and the other way around. Sometimes I also observe myself working as a madman where I talk to books and books talk back to me. Some books at the bookstore, they shout for, you know, crave for attention and some simply whisper their powerful existence. You know, a couple of years ago, I stumbled upon a quiet little book, The Rabbit and the Squirrel, with which my magical journey with Siddharth began. We'll talk about that as we move forward. But being a traditional bookseller, as Meeta thankfully <laughs> mentioned, I also championed the thought and importance of print books. The feeling of holding this delightful book in my hand it was so unique, you know, I'm not even talking about the content yet. The entire production, the design, the layout, everything about this, I hope you can see it. It's so personal. Thank you for doing the, the way it has come out. You know, I'm coming to Siddharth's work. He has this uncanny habit of gently wrapping you in his calm voice, mellifluous demeanor, if I could say so, and powerful words. While you read or listen to him, he makes you feel special, important, and most importantly, loved. And I'm truly honored for the opportunity of being in conversation with this literary giant of our times. Before I invite Siddharth, let me tell you, today's conversation is not between a bookseller and an author, but a teacher and a student. He has remotely taught me a lot through his writing. 
sometimes through his sub subtle replies to my email. I humbly bow down in gratitude for all the grace I've experienced through him. And to introduce Siddharth, please allow me to borrow a line from your own book. His words landed in my heart like a stone thrown in a pond. Ripples everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, Siddharth Dhanwan Sangu. Thank you, Mohit. My God, it's an introduction that uh, could very well double as a eulogy. I feel like I've died. <laughs> All these wonderful things that are being said about me. I'm entirely undeserving of um, anything that you say, but I'll happily ha take it on because I'm uh, a glutton for this kind of uh, incredible readership that's so sensitive and meaningful. Um, writers everywhere, but especially to me, um, because I have such a profound relationship also with Jaipur. You know, I was telling Amita earlier that I wanted to wear my shirts that I bought from uh, Saurashtra Impex from Kishorbhai Maheshwari, who I go to see every year when I, I'm reading at JLF. Uh, and so I wore that in uh, allegiance to Jaipur, the city of beautiful aesthetic and also incredible readers. Uh, Loss owes its existence to uh, people like Mita, you know, who, uh, who's the book's agent, but also the book's very, very close friend. So this makes it especially uh, special for me to be here. And when Rabbit and Squirrel was launched, um, Mohit had helped parent an event for it at Hava Mahal, which was perhaps one of the most magical uh, events um, that I had been lucky enough to be a part of, you know, just the good fortune to come to Jaipur and to have that extraordinary reception. Uh, while I can't replicate it right now, we can certainly have uh, a very beautiful conversation. Thanks to Mohit. Mohit, thank you so much for having me back uh, uh, in your heart, in your reading space. I'm very grateful for that. I so wish we, we could do this, you know, with you physically present here and with everybody around. But had been truly magic, magical. Well, coming to the book, Siddharth, loss is a very personal narrative. Is it your attempt for redemption at something or is it spiritual provocation towards the deeper meaning of life? So Mohit, uh, very briefly to, to people who may be listening in is that uh, loss is a collection of uh, four essays, one photographic and three, uh, tracing the ends of my parents' life and, and, and the death of my dog. Um, they are, I'll tell you how the book came about, you know, before I go to the much more deeper question of writing as redemption, because I'm not as profound and as deep as you, but to perhaps give context to how it came into existence. And um, I had written an essay after I lost my father in 2018. And I had shared this with uh, uh, Amitabh Bachchan, who sometimes reads uh, very graciously first drafts of my work. And I said it to Amit Uncle, and normally he's quite laconic, you know, with his responses, and he would just say wonderful, or, or he might not respond if he didn't, you know, uh, if it, something didn't have a resonance with him. But this was the first time he sent me a message saying, I want to publish this on my blog. So I, I just, I mean, you know, it was such a personal essay. I had no um, desire to publish it. But, you know, when Amitabh Bachchan sends you a message saying that, look, you know, I want to publish this essay on my blog, you have to kind of pay attention. And so that's what I did. And so in some senses, the book's genesis is owed to his readership, to his first primal urgent readership. And he called me and messaged me and I was living in Madrid at the time in Spain. Um, and when he published it, the kind of response I had, Amoy, it was so overwhelming. People from many corners, because of the reach of his blog, from many, many remote corners of India writing to me of what it felt like to lose a parent, what it felt like to lose their mother. And then it made me realize that this is the true work of a writer, is to find how it is that people uh, are in pain and perhaps to hold a mirror to that pain so that they recognize they're less alone in their suffering. So I'm very grateful to Amit Uncle for uh, being the first publisher of, of this book in its most uh, uh, nascent of that. And to answer your question of whether writing is redemptive, I really have no idea. I know that it can sometimes seem like a very meaningful distraction, you know, that uh, making sentences and going from one thought to another can perhaps distract you from how overwhelming and how 
sad life essentially is, you know, that, I mean, I, I subscribe to the Buddhist notion that the true nature of life is suffering. Um, so I don't know about redemption, but I, I know that I derive some amount of clarity. I write to clarify my life. I, I, I write to give coherence uh, to it. And, and that's really what this book was. In its finished form, I would hope that the climate of its intimacy would allow other readers to enter the narrative and to recognize how they had lost and how they are grieving. Um, that was really the intention. It was a, a community book. So I don't know about redemption. Uh, I would hope so, but um, uh, it was also a very meaningful aesthetic exercise for me. It's, it's actually very personal. You know why I started with that question was I assumed and I got so carried away with your writing that I, you know, I thought everybody is on the apologies, everyone. I didn't know, <laughs> realize. Well, such a... well, not at all. I wasn't in <laughs> any way contradicting. I was just opening up that observation to say that yeah. in addition to, to writing being redemptive, it was also aesthetic. It was also um, with the hope that somebody else could enter, a reader could enter that narrative and perhaps find something like closure or something like redemption or something like distraction from their own uh, suffering for a brief time. And that would have been uh, meaningful. If you found redemption, uh, Mohit, it's uh, a testament to your own profound reading, to your own beautiful mind. That's what it is. Thank you. So another thing I want to ask you now is, at such a young age, how did you achieve the kind of thinking you have? You know, it's very intriguing. Language from what I feel is a skill and that can be learned and which you have honestly mastered now. But to develop such heartwarming content, you need a mature mind. Can you tell us about your journey as a seeker? You've already explained as an author. Well, I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I absolutely am, am so grateful for that praise. I would, you know, take it all back and put it at the feet of my grandfather, Dr. Arvind Vasavda, who was the uh, head of department uh, of philosophy at Banaras Hindu University, at BHU, um, where in fact my mother was born. So, you know, we grew up in a very intellectually stimulating environment. You know, my mother would be reciting um, poetry that she had written or extracts from Sharat Chandra, or my grandfather would uh, be speaking to us about an essay he was writing on the Tripura Rahasya uh, or a section of the Bhagavad Gita that he had done his PhD on. So whatever good that you have been able to derive from any of the work owes its existence to the ovarian lottery that I won, to, the, to this incredible DNA uh, uh, configuration that I just inherited. So there's absolutely no skill that I have. I have no talent, but I was very lucky to have, uh, you know, all the right people supporting me from childhood, namely my grandparents and my parents. Uh, and, and Dr. Arvind Vasara was really just a phenomenal mind, you know, he knew Dr. Freud, he knew uh, and had studied with Dr. Carl Jung um, in Zurich, I think he was the only Indian who had uh, studied with uh, Dr. Jung and, and then later on taken Jungian psychology to America. So, you know, that and then he, had, you know, he had done his PhD uh, under Dr. Radhakrishnan. So the, the environment was very conducive uh, to books, to thinking about, uh, you know, larger ideas, um, my mother and I were always talking about uh, how do we give coherence, how do we give meaning to our lives, and constantly relating that to literature, to art, to music, uh, if for no other reason but then to distract ourselves from the calamity at hand. And there were many. <laughs> so it runs in the DNA then. <laughs> wow. You know, if I could, you know, uh, coming back to the context of your book, if I could have Put, put a blunt question across. And before the session, I was just discussing the same thing with Mita. Loss is a harsh reality and presumably the only truth. Can we ever prepare ourselves for the loss of a dear one, let alone our own selves? And how do you deal with all this? Well, everything in life, in, in a sense, is a, a preparation for death. You know, the question to really ask is not just, you know, how do you want to live, but also how do you want to die? 
you know, and, and that can be answered on so many levels. And I'll to so that we locate it within the realm of, of this book. One of the things I talk about in the essay about losing my dad who passed away at the age of 80 from brain cancer was that he had been diagnosed with cancer at the age of 72. He had a remarkable recovery, a hundred percent remission and he was completely fine. Physically he was, you know, mint. And yet a lot of his cognition, a lot of his um, thinking had been affected by the chemotherapy and the cancer, which was located in the brain. So that uh, really diminished the quality of his life. And my sisters and I would talk about how we would have responded if we had been in our 70s and had lived a full life and had no assurance of what treatment would do to us, um, you know, whether the recovery was really a recovery or just an extension to life without meaning. And at the same time, you know, Mohit, uh, the last eight years of my life, my father had lost some of his cognition, lost his short term memory. So he would sit in a chair and I would photograph him and I would sometimes ask him and I'd say, you know, what are you doing, Papa? You know, how are you spending this time? And there were always two responses. He would say to me that I'm praying for you, you know, um, which I think now nourishes me in a way that I really can't uh, measure the generosity of, uh, of his prayer. But also, I think he was praying for his own death because he would often tell us that. And so when he did die, it was in his sleep and he had the best death ever because he had had a big bowl of strawberries and fresh cream. He went to bed and he never woke up. And, um, and to me, that's the death of a king. You know, that's the kind of death that really you have to spend eight years of your life praying for before you can enter it. So um, yes, you can prepare for it. Yes, you can and you have to think about it, you know. Um, the founder of Mukti Bhavan, which is in hospice in Banaras, talked about 12 lessons that he had learned from watching over 13,000 people die at his hospice uh, uh, in Banaras. And he said that one of the most important things was to mend all your relationships before you die or try to mend them as much as possible. That became really, really tantamount to me during the pandemic. And one of the things I did in my isolation of my life in Goa was to write letters to a lot of people who I believed I had wronged, who I believed I might have hurt, and to apologize and to say, you know, 10 years ago, we had a falling out and I never really put that into context. Here's what I feel about it now. Here's how profoundly sorry I am. And I hope that you are able to move on with your life. I'm sure you have, but I needed to, uh, to specially convey my regret and my apology. And that was one of the most meaningful things that I was able to do during the pandemic because his words uh, stayed with me of, you know, mending all the, the relationships in your life before you take off. So there are so many different ways to answer your questions. And these are just uh, a few of them of physically looking at, you know, your own health and saying, you know, if you are of a certain age and if you have lived really well and, and fully, do you need to, do you want to continue with your existence? And if you want to, what is the meaning of those years uh, to you? So that's one question. And then, you know, how do you prepare? And, and one of the things that I did to prepare for my own end, whenever that is, was to try and fix all the loose ends. Oh, it is indeed very personal and very painful. I mean, you've described your father's uh, experience going from there, you've touched upon the painful and the, the other painful end that you witnessed. It's quite a journey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speechless, honestly. You mentioned relationships. I'll, I'll come to that. You know, you beautifully described the value of relations in our lives through loss. How do you suggest we consider their value, not in retrospect, but in present? 
by recognizing that the only real gift you can give to somebody is presence. Um, you know, I just want to back up a little bit and say that, you know, when I mentioned uh, about sending the essay to Amitabh Bachchan, uh, it wasn't to drop a name, you know, it could easily sound like that, that, oh, you know, here's an author who's trying to establish, uh, you know, who he sends his work to. The reason I had sent that essay to Amit Uncle was when my father passed away, I was in Jaisalmer. They're very close family friends and Amit Uncle Jaya, Abhishek and Aishwarya were the first people to be there even when I was not there when my father dropped his body and they waited until so much time that I came back. And the thing that I learned from that one beautiful gift, invaluable gift that they gave me was really of how presence, of how being available to somebody emotionally and psychologically um, is really how relationships exist, is how you keep them alive. I saw that also, you know, Mohit with my mother, you know, she was very severely disabled. Now you could say that for somebody like her who was bed bound, who, who couldn't really leave her room, who uh, couldn't walk, who was just in one place, she couldn't have too many relationships. You know, she was here was a woman who, who, who was just, who couldn't move left or right. Um, what relationships could she have had? And yet all I remember growing up as a child was she had a portable stub that was brought in by her bedside and she would organize, you know, uh, kakras and chivra and all these wonderful snacks that she was always sending to people, uh, you know, who somebody who was sick or somebody who had just come back from hospital or somebody who had died or somebody, you know, it was somebody's birthday. And it's now in retrospect that I see how she made herself available to people in so many subtle, uh, ingenious ways that I choke up even now thinking of, you know, how she was always available. So to me, that's really how relationships have been uh, lived out. I'm not even sure if I'm able to answer the profoundity of your question. I'm, all I'm really doing is circling back uh, to, the, to the people in this book uh, and to be able to answer your question in relationship to lost. Am I making any sense to you, Mohit, or uh, <laughs> am I babbling? Every answer, with every answer, you're rendering me further speechless. I hope not from boredom, Mohit. I hope you're not <laughs> passing out from that. <laughs> Coming to the professional aspect or your passionate aspect of, you know, writing, you mentioned your dear friend Amitan's message that you received on WhatsApp. Death is a reminder. There's always more that could have been said. Mm. Tell me, how can we bring the, you know, our focus to creativity when you've had yourself had such a personal loss? I mean, how do you balance that? I mean, if I could simply and bluntly put it, balance your emotions with creativity, with work. How does that happen then? Because you recognize that, you know, if you are a writer, on so many levels, you are at the service of the solitude of the reader. You know, when I was writing this book, there was always a tension. You know, what if it seems like it's calling attention to itself. What it seems like, oh, you know, here's a writer who had everything is now somehow asking for sympathy and saying, oh, you know, my parents died, feel bad for me. It could easily become, uh, you know, a book like that. So you're very conscious that just because you have an audience, just because you have a, a publisher, what is it that you want to say? And how do you want to say it in a way that will have some meaning to a reader's life. How will she open the pages of a book like Loss and find some kind of spiritual nourishment that will help her go from point A to point B? That was really uh, the intention. So I don't even think of it in terms of creativity. I don't really think of myself as a creative person. I think of myself as someone who watches life, who bears witness to life. Um, and that's really what uh, loss really was. It was a collection of observations. It was a collection of uh, meaning making out of tragedy. Uh, that's really what I was trying to do. <clears throat> and Siddharth, do you see a difference between Siddharth before loss, the book 
and after writing this when this came out and it's hardly been much time but have you observed any difference after you published this or brought it out yes uh, you know mohit what i do observe is how deeply loved this book has been i've never had even for rabbit and squirrel which you helped uh, launch in jaipur i never had such a profound response you know i mean i i had people who read it who loved it people like yourself people like meeta but this book felt like had been able to commit some kind of service you know that it felt uh, that you know 20 years of writing finally culminated into an event of some vague meaning that's what it felt like the number of people who said that you know how reading this helped them process the ends uh, of their parents life uh, you know the deaths that they had suffered that made me um, very sensitive it made me very grateful that i am lucky enough to be a writer you know coming back to the book you you this has some beautiful pictures i don't know you know i feel so different doing this digitally but this everybody has to see you know this particular picture i don't know if it's visible here i'm sorry this is a football on a ground and a pair of legs dressed in formal so you know you literally feel that the, the, these pictures also make you ask so many questions is it is it like uh, you know getting over the feeling of uh, the the simple re- reflection of outgoing the real fun we begin with our lives the formal trousers juxtaposed next to a football um you know just so that i can give a little context mohit um to those the photographs are one essay in the book uh-huh. and um they were shot between 2008 and 2011 uh-huh. and the uh, and the and the context to that is that um my father had been diagnosed with this cancer and i uh, was keeping him company with the camera i was watching him and documenting him those photographs were then later sh- um, shown at galleries in bombay delhi in stockholm in hong kong and to my mind they became the first draft of this book so you know when somebody says oh you know you wrote it in two years or whatever yes i wrote the book in two years but i had in a sense been collecting the material since 2008 so those photographs really were the first draft uh you know the impetus the kind of memory collection that happens you know when you document something with a camera a lot of them were you know like the one that you pointed out of the football uh and and the pair of legs they were just uh, aesthetic elaborations and they were elaborations on the solitude uh, of my father's life with cancer you know of uh, the sense of a game not knowing whether it's starting or whether it's ended you know and that's why the football is uh, is still <laughs> you don't know if the individual is going to is going to play the game or if the game is uh, actually over <clears throat> and that's really for the reader and that's really for the viewer to decide so coming back you know siddha to sum it all up this is a very very personal thing you've come out in the open with where did you get all the courage from oh because i, I you know i wasn't even thinking of publishing this book um mohit as i said you know it was an essay and the you know before that it was photographs i had no ambition or desire um, propelling me you know that if i was thinking very consciously and the genesis of this book was that harper collins had approached me to publish my non fiction and uh, we were going to put together certain essays over the last 18 years that i had written and i was correlating that i was at a residency an artist residency in italy and we had done a contract and everything and it was going to come out later that year and i realized it was too lazy you know it was too convenient it was just an author who had been handed you know free pass to a publishing house and they wanted to publish his non fiction essays and and you know and it was coming out 
I just, I, I, so I called up my publisher, Udayan Mitra, and I said, you know, I'm sorry, but this just feels too easy and too lazy. And what can we do to defer this? Because I want to think about this a little more. And when I did the essay on losing my father was a singular uh, thing that stayed with me. It was a singular thing that said, this is of lasting uh, meaning. This is a, has a certain echo and it will have an echo with readers. So when I wrote that and put it in the centerpiece of this book, the other essays followed quite naturally. And that's how the book came to be. So to answer your question, if I had been, you know, very consciously thinking that, oh my God, this is a book about my parents and about, you know, the losses I have lived through, uh, I would probably have stopped, perhaps because I'm just very private by nature, you know. Um, but sometimes you are only courageous for all the fear, uh, you know, that you have endured, because without fear, there is no courage, you know. So <laughs> it's kind of <clears throat> connected. And, and loss, how you consider it a beginning or an end? Uh, the book? Both. I mean, this is not just a book, you know. <laughs> well, the book, I hope it will be a start. I'm too young to cover a dick moment unless you want me to. And that's Mita, who's like basically checked out. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's all finished, you know. Um, no, I think uh, one of the things that the pandemic also reminded me was I want to get back to writing. You know, it became the central thing in my life in the last eight months. You know, it was something that I did on the side. It was something sort of silly and romantic, um, you know, to make books. Uh, but with loss, I felt that now I can call myself a writer. After 18 years of being a novice and continuing to be a novice, this is the book uh, that I can, you know, there was a bar where you had to show your ID for being an adult to get, <laughs> this would be my ID. I would say that this, with this, you can give me as much alcohol as possible. <laughs> uh, and so that's what it, uh, it really is. It's my ID into, uh, into being a writer. Could I invite you to read something from your book, Siddharth? Or maybe if you could, you know, generally tell us a story. Um, can I read you a passage that I wrote yeah. in Rajasthan? Uh -huh. And, you know, my dad passed away in uh, Bombay and I was in Jaisalmer at uh, a friend's uh, hotel when I got the news. And I thought I'd never go back to Jaisalmer. I'd never go back to Rajasthan. I felt such a heaviness for those four hours driving from Jaisalmer to Jodhpur airport and feeling so isolated at that time. You know, you want to be with your family uh, and now suddenly you're on the road and, and, and you're going back to a death. And sure enough, as you know, everything in life we learn only so that we can unlearn it. So that if I had decided that I was never going to go back to Jaisalmer, it meant that I had to, and sure enough for work, I had to go back two years later. And that's where I wrote the conclusion of, of the essay, you know. So can I read you a small paragraph from that? Please. Why I had returned to Jaisalmer, I had no idea. But what I got out of that trip is something you might know already, that you will go on. My father's death was an insurmountable truth, but with time, its terror had paled to become what it was, a fact, but not the truth. On my stroll at sunset, a memory of my childhood returned. As children, after dinner, my father would insist that my sisters and I walk the long straight length of the compound in our house. To us as kids, these walks were deathly dull. Although later I would come to see walking as a way of thinking, of airing the mind. On these walks, my father told us stories. Once upon a time, he started. In a magical kingdom, there lived. Those early stories of animals in the jungle, of escape artists and runaway princesses, of witches and dwarves, 
were a powerful introduction to story listening and a prelude to a lifetime of reading. The cultural historian Marina Warner discovered that in Arabic, the root for the word watering, rawa, is the same as for a storyteller, ravi, and imply that narration is irrigation. My father was out every night, walking his kids, telling them stories, making sure that his garden would one day bloom. Thank you, Papa. I get that now. I get you now. I hope it's not too late. You know, there was, when I read Rabbit and the Squirrel, I hadn't met you. Right. And I read Lost after having me met you. That's a huge difference. Anybody who listens, all the people who are in attendance right now, having read your books before having met you and have, reading them after listening to you, a huge difference. I mean, you know, you, you feel as if you're personally reading out the entire book to you whenever I'm reading it without you in presence. That's the person, you know, the, the power of what I personally felt. Well, perhaps you do that because you are yourself such a generous person that you can inhabit even a, a, a writer's reading as a gift to you, which it really is. And I absolutely wrote uh, so much in this book for you, for Mita and, to, and for Haven, and for every reader who was able to derive something out of it. Um, so I would probably just, you know, hand the compliment back to you. But to circle back to, to the subject of literature and, 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 and to books, one of the people who has felt like a spiritual uh, master to me is Toni Morrison, the African-American Nobel laureate who passed away uh, a few years ago. And she said that the extraordinary thing about a novel is that the writer writes only half of it. And that's just the clues that she gives to the reader's mind and her consciousness. And then the writer and the reader must take all of that and make her own story. And that's really what you were doing. You know, it was the chorus where I was being able to bring half the music and then you entered it with the other half. And that's what every reader does because without the reader, it's just an echo chamber. It's just music inside my own head. What you do is you make a concert out of it. And that is your profound and particular gift to the world. So I can't thank you enough for that, Mark. It's very difficult to give you a compliment without getting one in your tongue. <laughs> Coming back to, you know, there's so many profound messages, so many profound sentences you've mentioned in your book. And I came across another one. I would read out and I would request you to highlight again on that. My view of the world would never be that of an intellectual who relies on the refinement of perception, but of a monk who believes in prayer, forgiveness, acceptance, all as one. This was your view, which you beautifully mentioned here. How do you achieve that? You know, what then I want to ask is beyond knowledge. I think acceptance. <clears throat> and I would talk about this to my mother because she was so severely disabled and so much in suffering. And I would walk in her room back and forth across from her bed and we would talk about, and I would be constantly asking her that, you know, why do you think this happened to you? You know, you've always been a decent person. You've always been a good person. You know, she grew up in Rajasthan. Her, her father, my, my grandfather, Dr. Arvind Vasavda, had set up, uh, you know, he was a professor at Jodhpur University. So we've had a very profound connection with Rajasthan over the years. And I would ask her, you know, what in your childhood in Rajasthan had prepared you for this lifetime of suffering? What in your journey had propelled you to this station of uh, such matchless anguish and the only thing that she would uh, you know and, and and we would link it to theories of karma or we would talk about it in relationship to characters in uh, bengali fiction you know she would talk about charulata uh, uh, or we would you know eventually end up singing uh, you know a beautiful piece of music all of it made us realize that the only thing greater than the kind of wisdom or the kind of knowledge that you can have to make a conversation interesting or stimulating 
And what's beyond that is just silence. And what is beyond that is just acceptance. And so that was just a lesson that I really learned quite early on uh, from her because there was no way to get around it. There was no way to, for her to have any logical answer to why uh, you know, she was so severely ill, why she had suffered for 25 years. She just became eventually a student of pain. And I look at her now, I think that's what her role in life was. That it was the dissertation that she was meant to write. That was the knowledge that she was meant to gain in this manifestation of her life, uh, was how to live with pain, how to understand its nuances. You know, Virginia Woolf wrote an essay uh, on pain in, uh, where she talked about how we don't really give it the seriousness that it really deserves in literature. You know, you talk about gender, you talk about uh, wars, you talk about, um, you know, the larger themes that obsess academic life and academic academicians. But the most important thing, things in life are, are love and pain because they are the two constants that are, we are oscillating uh, between uh, at all points of time. So I would say acceptance and I would say silence is perhaps a thing uh, that supersedes wisdom and knowledge. But you can't get to it unless you've, you know, you've got to do the work, you've got to pay the bills, you've got to, you know, have some amount of awareness of it before you can set it aside. You know that word, that beautiful philosophy, niti, niti, not this, not this, which is to say, you know, you have to, partake in everything, you have to partake in, you know, alcohol and, and, and all manner of vices before you can turn around and say, no, not this, not this. But it wasn't limited only to vices. That philosophy was also limited to all the good in life, you know, all the, all the beautiful things that are exchanged where you too would look at that and say, not this, you know, not even to the most profound marriage, not even to the most profound wisdom. Even that is really not enough. <clears throat> Acceptance of love and pain <laughs> is the true reality. What next, Siddharth? Um, I want to write a new novel. I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but that's really um, on my mind, you know, for the next sort of five-year plan. If we all if come through the pandemic, if I come through the pandemic, uh, that's something... Uh, that's close to my heart. And really with this book, I just wanted to go, you know, if this pandemic hadn't happened, I told Mita that I just want to go from people's homes and to read to them, you know, like a bhikshu, uh, you know, who goes with a little bowl asking for food. I just wanted to, to go with this book and say, you know, can I read you something? Um, and here I am, you know, in this postmodern world where I'm doing that thanks to people like Mita and you. I'm not going physically into people's uh, uh, homes and their lives, but I am thanks to Zoom and thanks to the pandemic and thanks to, you know, how readers are uh, changing and expanding. So I'm, I'm so grateful uh, for all the lessons that this year has given us, but keenly the, the readers that one is lucky to encounter through Zoom. I would never have had this access, you know, it would have been one more event in Jaipur, one more event in uh, Bangalore, and it would have been sitting on a stage. But this is really what is of meaning to me, of being able to speak to, uh, to wonderful booksellers, uh, to people who work in, uh, with books, and most importantly, to readers. So I'm very grateful to the Prabha Kaitan Foundation to, and to the sponsors of this evening for putting it all together and for allowing me to be a a big show of uh, stories and to come to your doorstep with them. Well, there's other aspect to all of this, what you've said, Siddharth. This, of course, is a blessing. I mean, talking to you right now, but also the current context, you know, we are technically digitally drowned with noise. So amidst all this, I mean, you know, like people who are sitting in the city, how do we silence ourselves and just concentrate on the important aspects? You know, go back to asking meaningful questions to our own selves. Well, I think that perhaps that's one of the jobs of a book. You know, we don't necessarily always derive wisdom from reading alone. I think it's the act of reading. It's the act of sort of sitting down 
see versus music you know which you can listen with other people or uh, uh, or you could go to the cinema with 400 people and, and have the same experience or watch on a screen yourself. But with a book, you have to engage in solitude. You have to turn around and say, I'm going to sit down for half an hour and I'm going to read my book, uh, you know, much against the wishes of all my family members who want me to be doing something right now. I'm going to sit down quietly and read. And somehow in the act of reading, in the act of cutting yourself out from the rest of the world, you're already preparing yourself, um, you know, the, for the path that awaits you in, your, in, in the fourth sector of your life. You know, when you have a sense of vairagya, when you have a sense of distaste for the rest of the world and, and, and you're going through this neti, neti, not this, not this. And if you're lucky enough to give your mind and your consciousness and your spiritual self practice with reading, you're already on that path. So um, that's why I think, you know, the service of a bookseller uh, is just invaluable because you're allowing people to, to get back to their own uh, deeper selves. That's really the most important thing that happens with a book. Listening to you, I'm tempted to ask another yeah. question. <laughs> Have you had a formal spiritual training? Also, you mentioned Buddhism. No, I have never had any spiritual training whatsoever. Uh, it was just literally my, as I said, you know, my grandfather and the environment uh, that he grew up in. You know, he did his uh, uh, PhD on the uh, 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 section of the Bhagavad Gita called the Tripura Rahasya. Um, so, you know, you grew up in, in, in uh, an environment of questioning which I think is really, really important. You know, you see that right now in India, you see how we look down on questioning, you know, on, on different levels, you know, even politically, when you're looking at how this administration makes very little room for interrogation. It makes you think, you know, what is the kind of um, society that we're all uh, uh, really living in? Something, uh, I wish there were more questions. I wish that readers were more uh, an integral part of political life as they have been before. You know, you've had great, great minds who were political uh, officers. And it's, a really, it's really sad to see people in positions of power today fabricating uh, educational degrees, fabricating uh, data, fabricating and going against science uh, as they have, particularly in countries like America, you had Trump, who is a COVID denialist. Um, you see, you know, when you have a society which reads a lot more, uh, societies like Iceland, societies like Sweden, the awareness uh, is heightened. We've always had it in India. You know, we've had that culture of reading, culture of books. It has gotten lost somewhere along the way. And I think that all of us uh, would be doing a very valuable service if we could remind ourselves of how important reading is and how it is, in a sense, formative practice uh, for spiritual life. You know, when you go into a monastery, when you go into an ashram, they do ask you to read texts. You know, you go into an ashram like Meher Baba's ashram in Ahmednagar, you go into an ashram in Rishikesh, uh, there will be uh, texts that you are asked to, to read to prepare your mind. Uh, and that's really an important part of a cultural life that I think is in decline and is, uh, is missing, honestly. Taking that a step further, like I'm sure a lot of people in attendance also, when we read too much or when we start reading or when we start getting the feeling that he's reading too much, we also want to start writing. Hmm. So as a professional writer, what would you suggest? How do we begin? How do you know, we accept the fact that we have something to say how do we get that courage, that confidence that, okay, what I have to say is unique and could be of value to others? How do I assess that? And how do I just go out in the open and just start writing? Well, it connects back to your previous question. I think um, Sata, who said was that uh, reading was a, was a form of writing. You know, you can't really be a writer unless you have consumed you know, profound volumes of uh, literature. You know, it, it just doesn't happen uh, in a vacuum. So um, I would say 
just go back to the reading. Just go back and read and read and read. That's really, really quite uh, uh, impressive. And then, you know, people will find their own voice because it comes from stilling yourself. It comes from being at that place where you are finally hearing the most unadulterated part of your consciousness. That's really what writing is. You make it sound so beautiful, Siddhartha. Thank you. <laughs> One last question I want to ask. You know, you've, you've mentioned uh, your friend, uh, tr true pleasure of a dog's company lies in exchange of meaningful questions. Meaningful quietness, I think. It's meaningful questions. Is it meaningful? Or quietness, yeah. Yes, quiet. What's the difference between quietness and questions? We can't get to questions if we are not quiet. So maybe we, we talk about both. Absolutely. You know, to... Well, I think very specifically to, to respond to that is it, what I meant by an exchange of meaningful quietness is, you know, the cultural ecology of our lives places emphasis on meaning as something uh, that's transacted with language or with visuals, you know? So if you read a book, you have somehow something profound to say. But when you are friends with a dog, as I have been lucky enough to be with many, but especially Bruschetta, who uh, enjoys an essay of her own in loss, is a recognition that uh, that is one of the most sincere forms of love. I think Amy Sedaris says this best, is that you know the death of a dog hurts us so much more than the death of a human being because you never had to pretend liking them, <laughs> you know. So, um, so it was with Brisketa very specifically uh, an exchange of quietness in the way that a dog can just enter a room and make you feel like uh, you know you're the best thing in it, even if you're not. Um, but you are too to to your dog friend. And that's really what, uh, what I meant by an exchange of meaningful questioning, a, me a meaningful uh, quietness. And I should have actually written questions because that's a much more beautiful phrase. Uh, I should have you know, shared the essay with you. Um, I think of it in what Rilke, uh, you know, the Austrian poet René Maria Rilke, he said that um, the job of a lover was to strengthen the solitude of the other. And I think that's also something that a dog does. It allows you to be alone, uh, just as a book allows you to be alone and strengthens your solitude and strengthens your resolve. Um, so here we are, you know, talking about dogs and books in this beautiful evening in Goa and in Jaipur. <laughs> Had this been a physical event, I would have asked everybody to remain in silence after listening to you for some time. You know, I get that feeling right now. I mean, digitally, we are bound to talk. I would just take all of this in and it will take time to settle down. Thank you. Any particular aspect of the book which you would like to talk about in specific right now, which is really, I mean, it's entirely the production of it. Of course, it's all deep, but any particular aspect of the book that you wish to talk about? Ah, gosh. Um. <laughs> this is exactly how you made me feel. How do I ask questions on this? <laughs> you shouldn't ask questions. You should tell. You know, I would much rather tell you about, um, you know, a book that I'm reading uh, rather than talk about my own work. And, and that is, uh, or that I'm rereading, which is Asymmetry by Lisa Halliday which I think is just such an extraordinary, it's a reconstruction of an affair with Philip Roth. And I think it's just sublime. I would ask uh, people to read um, Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking. I would ask people to read Paul Kalanithi's um, book, um, When Breath Becomes Air. Um, these are the affirmations and the recommendations. I would ask people to read Amy Tan's memoir, uh, Where the Past Be Begins. These are the real books, uh, you know, that I would suggest people to read and not, <laughs> not loss. So, uh, so I don't really have an, an, an response to that. <clears throat> wow, I'm out of questions. I mean, I need what silence. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be able to share some time with you, with the foundation and with Mita. Yeah, of course. 
So if we have anybody in the audience who needs to ask something, we have Thank something. Thank you, Sadat and uh, Mohit, for such a brilliant, brilliant session. Uh, Thank you, Sadat. Uh, so I would now like uh, the audience to please come forward and uh, ask their questions. Uh, how this works is that you have to use the raise the hand option on Zoom. I will unmute you and you can then ask your question. So we have the first question coming from Dr. Gautam Sen. Hello. Hi, Can Dr. you hear me? Uh, Siddharth, I am amazed at the parallel life I have lived. I am now 80 years old. Oh, wow. I'm, what a privilege that you're here. I'm so but, grateful for your time. Thank you so much for sharing. No, no. I, am, I thoroughly you. enjoyed what you said. You see, my mother was also suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. Mm. And which is what it seems your mother suffered from also. Yes, Dr. Sen. And, and she lived for nearly 30 years mm. from the early disease to total bedridden condition. Mm. But her spirit, mm. her involvement in the family never disappeared. Mm -hmm. And uh, even as we grew older, and we could possibly not give her as much time and attention that she required she would do it in such a way that we would hover around her at the spare time we had. I personally feel that she, if she had been healthy, I would not have changed my mental caliber, bearing and understanding of life as much as I did because she was an invalid. Mm. Waking up at night, giving her the turns, Mm. Helping her with the toilets, mm -hmm. giving her a glass of water. And what was most lovely was she would always wake up or be awake and ask for a piece of chocolate at 11 p.m. at night. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we would share with her. Yeah. And I, I'm looking forward to reading your book. I'm, I'm thoroughly engrossed in the conversation that Mohit and you have had. It makes it more tempting to read. Last <laughs> I'll read the book and come get back to you probably. Thank you very much. That's so Thank kind. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you, Moeda. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Mita. We have the next question coming from Sunita Pant Bansa. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Oh yeah, good. And I saw unmute, uh, unmute button here. Hi Siddharth, it was wonderful hearing both of you talk about loss. And it was such an engrossing uh, conversation, took me back to the times when I lost people. And, and you know, I can feel the same about my father. Uh, and my, when my daughters asked me, how do you uh, deal with the loss of your father? And I keep telling them, I'd, I never lost him. He's still around, you know? It, it's, it's something like that. Mm -hmm. So it really touched me and uh, I'm going to read the book. I'm looking forward to reading it. But uh, my question here is that uh, as we learn so much from our losses, you know, uh, do, don't you think we learn uh, much from gains as well, you know, in our lives? Uh, have you I can't agree with you more. I really can't because, you know, I, I had such a difficult childhood because of my parents' suffering that, um, that I decided that, you know, <laughs> Ever since I turned 35, I was going to put pleasure at the center of my life. And that's really what uh, sees me through now, you know? So I, I, I get to see both. If, I, if for 35 years, I had to see the darker side of life, I have now decided that I'm going to try my very best to engage with lightness. You know, you, if you look at all the uh, iconography of Krishna in, in art in Rajasthan, in Udaipur, for instance, you will see this idea of Leela and this idea of joy. You know, unlike the aesthetic manifestations that came uh, uh, from the West, you know, where you see very beautiful images uh, of, of Christ who was suffering, with Krishna, there's joy, 
you know, with, there's so much of happiness in, in everything that he does. And so I've decided that I'm at that stage in my life. I'm at the Krishna moment in my life where I want to experience Leela, where I want to go out dancing in the, in the night, in the fields. And I hope that that's where you are at uh, also. Uh, thanks. Uh, but uh, what I meant to ask was that, uh, you know, uh, were there any moments in your life where uh, there were some people or moments or, you know, that helped you to see this loss better? Because you need, uh, you know, the opposite to see, you know, it's like you need darkness to understand light better and vice versa. That's, that's what I'm trying to say that, you know, is it something because, you know, that's how we understand loss. I mean, loss of, is of something that we have, we treasure. Mm -hmm. So are there any other treasures in your life that helped you understand the loss better and, and to kind of get affected by it the way you did? Well, thank you for clarifying the question. You know, you, you got cut off in the middle, so I thought you had stopped and that was your question. So I apologize for uh, interrupting you. But I know exactly what you mean, that, um, that unless you don't have um, a parameter, uh, uh, a mirror, um, you know, to that loss, it, you can't really value it. You can't, you know, yeah. the, the, the palliative care specialist, uh, B.J. Miller, who ran a hospice in San Francisco. He talked about how death is what makes life precious. Yes. yes. And that's really just, you know, how I come to it. It's just something that stayed with me. So I hope you get a chance, you know, if you get a chance to, to Google uh, BJ Miller and see his TED talk, you know, he's, um, he has severe disabilities uh, from an accident, um, but he's one of the most inspiring TED speakers I've had the privilege of hearing. Uh, he's also an author, but he ran a hospice. He, he ran this beautiful service of allowing people to die meaningfully because he had lived uh, meaningfully. And to answer your question, that's really you know, what I would go back to, to see what he had to say of how death brings meaning and, and makes life precious for all of us. Yes, yes, that's very important because I have learned so much from my losses mm -hmm. and uh, they've enriched me so much in my writing also mm -hmm. that I feel that, you know, there is something that, you know, there's always something to learn, be it loss or be it gain. So yes. that, that's basically what I wanted to... Address. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. I said you're absolutely right. Yeah, I know, thank you so much. And hopes. So. I mean, I'm. I'm just waiting for this book to come to Thank me. You very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have the next question coming from Rimika Singhvi. Hello, Siddharth. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. How are you? Very well, thank you uh, so much for such a scintillating session and to Mohit too for his absolutely astute questions. You know, it's, it's, I mean, writer is as good in a session as the moderator. So thank you to both of you for, for the auditory and the visual delight. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, we would have loved to meet you, uh, you know, in Jaipur here, but of course, like you said, this medium also sort of allows us to reach far and wide. Um, I'm going to take your attention a little bit to the writerly craft, Siddharth. I'm a teacher of English literature, so I can't resist asking these two authors and who write, um, you know, so well as to how much, uh, because they do say that great writing is artistry. So mm -hmm. how much of a conscious artist are you? I mean, are you looking to sort of write that kind of a literary sort of mega kind of, you know, fictional work or, uh, you know, the, the, the whole bit about how, you know, you can't be taught creative writing. It just sort of consumes you and you go from there. And I don't know how much of it is sort of consciously built into the narrative. Yeah. Well, can I just be very specific when I answer your question, um, which is to say that with this book, I think what I learned most was the extraordinary involvement of the mm -hmm. editor. And I had three. I had Udayan Mitra, who was the publisher okay. of the book, mm -hmm. Mark De Silva, who's um, who was a columnist with the New York Times and as a writing teacher in America, mm -hmm. and uh, Bron Sabri, who was a literary critic uh, in, in Perth, Australia. Right. Mm -hmm. And really, when you're able to work with very fine minds, what they do is they really refine your work over and over and over again. Correct. Yeah. So um, 
I really didn't have any particular ambition that you speak of. Mm -hmm. But one of the learnings from writing loss was how invaluable a really fine editor can be uh, for your work. It's true. Absolutely. And thank, yeah. you yeah. and thank you for being an advocate of books. I'm so grateful to you for that. Thank you. In fact, it's, it's writers like you that open up new worlds and, you know, sort of give you that kind of vista to sort of take it back to us students and allow them to, to, to pay attention to each nuance of our you know, human experience, mm -hmm. uh, small or big, joy, loss or gain. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. We have the next question uh, coming from someone who's named TWC2231. I think it's their Zoom account is named like that. So. Hi. Hello. No, I think it's that I'm just trying to see. If... I don't think the same. So that I have one question uh, sure. and I've been uh, like going over it in my mind uh, for the past 20 minutes. Now, since you said that being present like has been a major theme, like as you mentioned your uh, father's, uh, father's death. Uh, so now there are two types of present, uh, like which I talk about. Uh, one is the physical presence and one is something which is which in Buddhism is is being like very mindful, the mm -hmm. mental presence, the ability to be mentally present in the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, my question regarding uh, that mental presence is that since loss is a book and you're dealing with memories, recollections, your own personal insights, which are so intimate. Um, uh, so when you're writing the book uh, and and going through it, how how how. What was the process like of going through your own personal uh, experiences and how did it strike your own consciousness? Well, thank you for that question. I think it was just a process of meaning making, right? Because sometimes when something as terrible as a death happens, um, the meaning of that death has to be construed by the living because the person you know, to whom this cosmic event called death has happened has already transitioned. So it's, it's the living who have to somehow take the pieces of that uh, and make something of a whole uh, you know, in that moment and which is really what loss was in some senses for me. The more I think about it, I feel um, very lucky that even when I was writing about death, I was being able to celebrate life. I was being able to give meaning to all of these people who had somehow nourished me so profoundly over the years. And that's really what stays with me. You know, that, that it, people can say, oh, you know, this is a book and it's so sad and it was, were you depressed? And I was like, no. I think at the end of it, what replaced the grief was appreciation. What replaced the sadness was a recognition that there had been this presence to begin with. So that's, uh, you know, how I now look at, uh, look at the book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. It's just uh, I think that uh, mute situation is what I've been in while listening to Siddharth. Um, I wouldn't want the session to end, Siddharth. Uh, much that I know that from the point of receiving the first draft of the essays to seeing this absolutely precious gem land up in my career one evening and then I sent you a picture saying it's finally here to rereading the entire book in that one evening straight away I couldn't resist it so what you talked about the uh, act of reading the act of acceptance the act of being present um, the book teaches you a lot more than just processing 
the loss and the emotions that you feel when you lose people who are precious to you, who, who have built your life in more ways than one. I, there's just one sentence very aptly put at the, uh, at the back of the book, which says, grief is not a record of what has been lost, but of who has been loved. <laughs> And with that, I'm going to say many, many thank yous to you, Siddharth, for adding so much richness to our lives by just being who you are, not just being a writer, but by being who you are. And I'd like to thank my audiences for being here and asking such meaningful questions. And uh, Mohit, thank you so much. God bless you. Because you, I couldn't have found a better moderator for Siddharth. Thank you so much for holding everything together. Thank you, Mohit. I, I feel so lucky that you were in my co-conversationist. And thank you, Mita, for blessing this book into its existence and this conversation into its being. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone at the Prabhakatan Foundation, to all the readers who came, and to Haven, who moderated this for us from behind the scenes so wonderfully and seamlessly. Why, my one million bows of respect and joy to each of you. I'm thank too you. spellbound to even say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank I understand. I understand that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.